Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Hydrophone. In this podcast, I'm going to be interviewing the most interesting people I can find in the ocean world. It's going to be photographers, explorers, filmmakers, conservationists. And I really wanted to start off uh, with a bang. And I have a very special first guest, who I'm also proud to call my friend, a wildlife photographer, groundbreaking expedition leader, and an old school badass. Amos just turned 70 two days ago, actually, okay. which means that you are from the good old days where uh, boats were made of wood and men were made of steel. <laughs> <laughs> I never uh, heard it. That's very good. I, I'm going to keep it now if I can. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amos, you were born in Israel in 1950. Exactly. And like most people in your country, you did your military service. What a lot of people don't know, which I found is really interesting because it's like a really strong piece of history, is that you were the second in command in the Entebbe operation. Uh, this happened in if 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 I if I have my facts right, July fourth, nineteen seventy six, uh, Palestinian terrorists hijack Air France one thirty nine, going from Tel Aviv to to Paris, and they landed in the Entebbe airport in Uganda, and you were part of a covert military operation to rescue the hostages. Can we actually talk about this? Can can we know firsthand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, a few, a few things. Okay. First of all, I was a third in command, not second. Okay. That's important for the people to know. Um, I honestly prefer not to talk very much about it because I deliberately or probably single-handedly changed my life from being an officer or being in the military and all what we have done there in order to take the the knowledge and the experience of that and turn the, the scope from a gun or from terrorism into peacemaking and image making and telling positive story on the planet. Um, but I can say, uh, as you, since you mentioned it, that indeed a lot of things that I have been taught during the service have, um, I've applied in the field of wildlife photography, helped me to be a hunter, but a hunter for images for betterment of mankind. And that was really a drive. Uh, as you probably noticed, and some people ask me many times, I prefer not to talk about it because that is, for the rest of the world, is history. They don't, well, maybe they need to know and let them, let them look for it, but I don't need to talk about it any more than what we have done then. But what we need to talk is about what present. It does not help you or me uh, as a producer or as a public personas to make our past more than our present time. Our present is the critical one. No, I, I, I totally get it. get it. I didn't want to go deep into it. I just want to get a little concept of who you are as a person and how you got here. I think a second very important stage is that you moved to New York City and you went to film school in, a in NYU, right? Yeah. Under, yeah. under the tutelage of uh, Coppola and Scorsese <laughs> and all these like triple A let filmmakers. Me, let, let, me co let me correct it a little bit. I went, I took the test to get to the faculty of film and television. And the deans then were Francis Coppola, um, uh, Woody Allen, and, um, uh, uh, and Corsese. I was accepted out from 300 and some student that went to the school to test, I was accepted among the, third, from over 300, only 38 were accepted. I was one of them. And I could not pay the tuition. It was, uh, what was it? It was 1978, about um, April, May, June 78, yeah. And you were driving a cab at night, right? To make ends meet? Oh, because, because I could not afford it, I got really very driven to do something or as soon as I can. And then I started driving a taxi in New York to be able to earn a living. And um, the other part of the story was because my English was quite bad or not very good. And so I decided to learn English. And one of the things I did, I said, I'll take a diving course. 
And I went, there was a dive shop in New York called Atlantis 2 on 13th Street and 6th Avenue at the time. There's no there any longer. And I took a diving course and I went to the pool together with everybody else. Oh, I went in class and then in the pool. And uh, the instructor pulled me out. And uh, Butch Hendrick, till today, we are very good friends. He was the instructor. His father was one of the top Naui instructors at the time, or the leader of Naui organization. And he pulled me out of the pool. He pulled me out of the pool and asked me, what I'm doing here? I said, I came in to learn diving and English. He said, no, 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 you can teach the class. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because I always was very well in the water and I knew what I do. And I become one of the, one of the assistant instructors or dive master. And um, after this, in July 78, in July 78, um, there were opening to go to Cuba and the dive store, August 78, and the dive store took a group to go to Cuba. And I went with them and I saw the condition of the reef, which was supposed to be or considered the best reef in all the Caribbean compared to what I knew from home, from the Red Sea and from the Sinai Desert. And then I decided to go into the business of developing tourism into the Middle East, into Israel. That, that was going to be my next question. How did you take the leap from trying to make, to make ends meet and to go to film school in New York to leap into wildlife photography and leading expeditions and discovering all these new uh, places and encounters and all of that? Okay. So I worked at night as driving a taxi. That's how I made the money. And during the daytime, I work at a, at a dive shop. Uh, or teaching diving or taking that we went. It was until November 78, the time that I start putting myself together, get organized, get connection, write letters. Everything was by typewriter <laughs> or by <laughs> telex machine, which you don't know what is telex anymore. Yep. It is a machine that has make a lot of points on a, a strap of paper and you get it by the end and then you translate it. Anyway. I started doing that uh, till uh, November 78, and then I took the first group of four divers, um, and we went American. Some of the people that I met on the trip to Cuba, and this is how we start. I start forming my idea already when I was in Cuba, when I saw the reef and talking about the people because I had a lot of experience from the Red Sea and from Israel at the time, and I had some picture to show them how amazing the reef in the Red Sea was or is, and uh, four of them decided to join me and we did the first trip. And some of the picture I sent you today is from the se July, uh, November 78, we are on the back of a camels going diving in some of the remote location at the time. No vehicle could get into them. I had to go to the Bedouin, hire the camel, and the camel took us to the reef. The beautiful part of the reef in, in the Red Sea is relatively, there is a reef on the surface for about maybe five or seven meter. 10, 15 feet long, and then the wall. So the camel will bring us to the beach. We got off the camel, walk <laughs> another five, 15 feet, and can go dive on the wall. And that's how we started. Wow. And actually, you have been a, or, or you've been an inspiration for me for a long time because you're all about big animal encounters, and I'm all about big animal encounters, and you were a pioneer. You have photographed. You were one of the first people to be out of the cage with a great white. You have photographed uh, orcas, anacondas, nine crocodiles, pretty much anything we can imagine, even polar bears. And let's not get in the polar bears right now because we're going to go back into it. But polar bears aside, which was your most meaningful wildlife encounter and why? The truth is there is not one is more um, more special or more or different than the other. The truth, really. Because I say clearly, we are not God. We are just messenger, messengers of the wildlife. You, me, and the people like yourself and what you did in Pelagic and uh, Pelagic Safaris and uh, what you're doing now with uh, Baha, my love. Um, we are only messenger of what is there. And we leading the people, showing them, teaching them from our experience or guiding them by our experience what they can do as well. So all of the animals are unique and amazing. And every experience, even though if I did the Great White for so many years and the Onka for so many years, 
every year, the, every time we go there, they show us something different about their behavior and about their pattern of life. And that's what's so beautiful about it and so unique about it. I can actually tell you which was my most special encounter for me, as you may know, and a lot of people may know, my unicorn for a long time was to be able to find or to share the water with orcas in, in, in Mexican waters. And it finally happened in 2018. And I actually was able to see them hunting. And that was super special for me. Then in 2019, we, you and I, we put together some expeditions to try to find the orcas. Uh, you were mostly in the ocean leading your groups and I was mostly fi uh, flying the plane that we were using as a spotter plane to try to find the orcas. And on one of these days uh, that you actually found them, I was able to meet up with you in the middle of the ocean. And it was very special uh, for me because like I said before, 10 years ago, uh, you, you, you were a hero of mine that you later, later on, when, we, when I walked into the big leagues of the business, so to speak, we became friends. But I actually, when I was a young guy that didn't have an idea of how to start my career as an underwater photographer or wildlife photographer, I even emailed you. So I <laughs> <laughs> got a, a very cold reply, <laughs> but which of course it makes sense. But anyway, to be able to 10 days later, 10 years later, be able to be in the water with you sharing the Mexican ocean with orcas, it was very, very, very special for me. Uh, well, that, that was a parenthesis, but coming back to you uh, and back to the polar bear, I know that this was a major uh, paramount in your explorer life. And you had a, before you were successful in photographing polar bears underwater, you had a very interesting and probably a little too close of an encounter with a polar bear. How was it like? What happened? What went wrong? <laughs> what did you learn? No, nothing went wrong. We are all here. <laughs> but, but before that, I wanted to compliment you also. Uh, despite the fact that you got maybe, well, most likely I will not remember a cold reply for me, um, but you remember that quite well and you were brave enough uh, later on about two years ago, or three years ago to write me and to ask me to put a prolong for your, for your book. When I look at the book, I was, I was really taken. I was really impressed. And I, I felt Im proud to be able to do it, but not also for, for you, but especially for Mexico. And the reason is, I come also from a very small country and Mexico is a small country compared to America and all the conflict between Mexico and America with so many different things and so many different levels. So to do something positive for Mexico was for me a very empowering and a desire to uplift. And I discovered that Mexico has the third longest coastline in the world. So Mexico should be proud of what you can do with your ocean, what you can do with them, uh, with them, whatever resources you have around the country from what you do in this case is introduce people to the ocean and to the wildlife around Mexico or Baja California. And interesting enough, you call your new company Baja I Love. <laughs> Baja My Love. My Love. Baja My Love. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much, Amos. Uh, just to clarify also, uh, it's not only my book, it's a book I did together with my friends over at Pelagic Life, which is a, a nonprofit I was part of. And it, 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 it was also very special for me to have your words as a prologue or, or as a foreword for the book. So thank you for that. Thank you for the praise. But going back to that first encounter with the polar bear, so I, I really want to know, because I don't think we've ever, I, I've ever asked you about that first encounter. And I'm really the, intrigued. The truth of the matter, most people, even, even if they hear it, or they will have a hard time understanding that. So hopefully people will follow carefully what's, what's happening. 
in any trip that I've designed uh, for the big animals since the mid 80s, um, as, as an Israeli or whatever is the upbringing that I had, I had to explore that first. I spent a lot of money and a lot of time in my life as I was young to be able to explore, to get, to make sure that what I have, I'm the only one that have it and I know it very well. Um, and that means that to go by myself out there and to be able to find the people that will lead me to do that. Um, the most recent trip such that was the Anaconda when I got to Brazil eight years ago, only eight years ago, and they thought that I'm the craziest man in the world. Brazil, 80 to 100 million people, nobody been swimming with Anaconda before. And the guy that I took with me said, you are out of your mind, they never got with me in the water. Okay, that's eight years ago. So the polar bear was the same thing. I did research before and I learned at the time that polar bear from other two a filmmaker. One of them is uh, Raul Bravo, the guy, uh, the, the- Ramon man, Bravo. Ra Ramon Bravo, the guy that has the graveyard in, uh, in Isla Mujeres. In his record, polar bear will not dive more than 10 meters. And the same thing with another Italian filmmaker in 1959 and his report was the same. So that's what I took with me out when I went to the high Arctic on my own. And on the way, I found two or three other people that were diving there and I asked them if they want to join me and they said, yes, they will join me. And we went to the Inuit, we took a boat and we went out to look for the polar bear. We dressed up, we got, I'm going to the water, take the camera, jumping in, and the polar bear was about 15, 20 feet away from us. I was waiting for the second person, the buddy or the, uh, the and the body or safety diver to be with me in the water. My idea was not to be there alone. One of the few times that I don't do a solitaire diving <laughs> or live diving alone. But in this case, when you face an animal, especially predators, either on the land or in the water, always better to have one more person with you for whatever reason, either to document it, either to save it, to save each other, or either to tell the story. So I was in the water, I'm getting close to the bear. I'm ready to go diving, but I don't see the dive, the dive guy or the, the person beside me. I look back to the left, I did not see him. I look to my right, I look, and the boat was hanging, and he was hanging by the side of the boat. Apparently, he lost, when he went to the water, he lost the tank out of the BCD. So they could not attach it on the, in the water. He had to turn back, they took the tank off, took his weight off, and he had to climb back on the boat. I realized that I have one, one of two ways to go to do, either go back to the boat or to go diving. And I did not think I was fast enough on the surface with 35 pounds on my waist and the camera in the tank to swim back to the boat as the boat started moving because of the current and the, and the wind. I thought I'll be faster because I have so much weight on me to go diving and I went diving. And then the polar bear started to come after me. Based on the story that the people said, this Raul Bravo and, uh, and the, the Italian guy, and based on the idea that what I learned at the time about the physics of the polar bear, because of his fur and because of his blubber, it will not be able to dive deeper than one meter or two or one atmospheric pressure, more than one, and it will not exceed it. But this polar bear, I guess, did not, did not read the book or the rules and regulation. <laughs> And he went after up to almost 75 feet after me. And I was at about 80 feet when eventually he stopped and then I stopped. And he started to go back toward the surface. My heart was beating out of my dry suit. I was over breathing my regulator. I look at the gauge and I had the last maybe two or 300 pounds only left. And, but I could not go to the surface because I see the polar bear going and I saw them on the, on the surface. I had to stay. And then almost I had to have an emergency accent because I did not have any more air in the tank. By the last maybe, maybe 15, 20 feet, I, there's no more air. I sucked it all up and just excel and get to the surface and hopefully the polar bear will not be around. He was not around, but it took the boat to find me because I lost contact with the boat almost 45 minutes. I was freezing. <laughs> and, uh, but they found me and I'm here today. But then come the idea, I wanted to do it again, and I knew I can do it again. I knew I can, but I had to find the right team or the right opportunity to do it.
and we're going to talk about that. But now that you mentioned uh, Ramon Bravo, I, I want to show you something very special. Give me 10 seconds. Absolutely. Okay, headphones back on and uh, whiskey in. Okay, so this is wow. a book <laughs> called Buceando Entre Orcas, which is scuba diving among orcas. Ramon Bravo wrote this. He was also a pioneer. He was uh, Jack Cousteau's friend. He's Mexican. He did a lot of very interesting stuff. He took, he took Sylvie and Ginny Clark to swim with, uh, to be with the shark, the sleeping shark in the uh, Isla Mujeres. And, yes. and, and the ironic thing is he, he died in his house in Isla Mujeres changing a light bulb. Yes. <laughs> Out of like somebody that had been with polar bears and orcas and whatever shark you can imagine, he dies changing a light bulb. And that's actually the story I would tell my mom every time she would, she would like get scared that because I'm going to go to Guadalupe to free dive with great shark, with, with great white sharks, or I'm going to go with the anaconda in Brazil. And my mother would get super nervous. I, I would always tell the story of Ramon Bravo. Like, look, he did all these things and he died changing a fucking light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this book, Amos, is about Ramon's encounters with orcas in Mexico. And it was an inspiration for me to have that stubbornness to find the orcas in Mexico. Because I could have really easily gone to uh, Norway and Mm -hmm. Pro probably on the first or on the second try, I could have seen them there. But I really wanted to see them in Mexico and I knew they were here and it took me almost six years of constantly being out in the open ocean looking for them in Mac Bay, out of La Paz, out of Cabo to have the first encounter. And it paid off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so that was uh, another parenthesis. But the second time you went to look for the polar bear, you were successful and you were not only successful, but it was such an interesting story that they made a documentary about it. It was, it was it's a film called Picture of His Life. Uh, you actually invited me to one of the premieres in the Bay Area and I was fortunate enough to be there with, with Sylvia Earle and with yourself watching I was probably one of the first people to, to, to watch the movie on the, on the big screen. It's a great story because it's not only about the polar bears, it's a personal story and it's your life story and that's what I really like. But tell us a little bit more about this. What changed? What did you learn from the first time that made you succeed in such a way the second time you tried? So let me take it a little bit a little bit around and to make people understand where all this drive to look after the ocean giant or the big animal and how do you get to the polar bear. So for many years since the trip to Cuba and then to the Red Sea in 78, I was the first one to introduce a livable dive boat to the Red Sea. And for almost 10 years, I was running the business to the Red Sea and then we expand to many other countries around the world. But during this time, as I more perfected my photography or become more and more into the photography of, but as a photographer, because I got to all the business of diving and run diving business, not because of the business of diving, because my love for photography. I did before, uh, as the, before in Israel, I did fashion photography. I did what I was a war photographer. Those are the things that I've done, but they are not capture my imagination as the dive, as the underwater. But becoming a businessman, running a trip, I was in New York, running a trip on a boat, it was become a business. Eventually, I sold the company. I wanted to do something. I want to go back into photography, not into the business of uh, diving. But as a photographer, I had to find or to create myself a niche that will be different than all other to be able to be successful. That is the work of all artists, to, to find their own niche, speaking from their heart. And for me, the, the, heart was, the heart was into be able to be um, with the ocean giant in peace, how to, to highlight them in a very positive light, how to bring their story about them in a way which is not out from fear, but out of respect or harmony. And that was the purpose of my, uh, of my work with the ocean giant. 
working with the, uh, going after the polar bear become as a result of what happened in 74 when, um, when uh, Spielberg did the movie Jaws and gave the jo gave shark such unfortunately bad reputation. Um, so the only way which I knew as a still photographer was how can I create images of big animal that will be exactly opposite, 180 degree opposite. But to take more picture of great white will not help because, but to take picture of something else as equal or bigger than a great white is nothing like a polar bear because a polar bear work in the water and out of the water. is a master of both element. And that's what brought me to work with a polar bear in the first place. When it come for the movie, that what happened five years ago, it was a process that took 10 years. Uh, as you and I become friends, there was a young man in Israel uh, by the name Yonatan Neal, um, a photographer that wanted to learn how to be also a wildlife photographer. And he contacted me and I asked him, and he said, yes, you want to learn to work with me that I'll teach him how to be a photographer or to be his mentor. And I told him, I asked him one simple question as I ask everybody else, are you willing to sacrifice? And he asked me what? And I said, everything you got, money, time, friends, family. If you want to be a wildlife photographer, you have to be in the wildlife. And he said, yes. And from there on, we developed two years of relationship and he came working with me wherever I did. By the time he finished, or the time I told him that you are free to go do whatever you want, you are ready, you have a body of work. And I told him, but if I'll be in your age, he was about mid thirties, I'll go into film. I go into video, not to stay in stills. And he did. One of the first movie that he wanted to make, or the first movie he wanted to make, he wanted to make the movie about me swimming with the polar bear. <laughs> because he is really big for everybody else to catch. But it was very difficult to raise the money that was needed and to convince other media to buy into it and to give him money to do that. Uh, it took 10 years in the making, pitching and pitching the story all over the world, from New Zealand to Australia to Germany, France, Italy, of course, Israel and United States. And he got the initial amount of money, especially from France, Israel and Germany. And that's how he started. Eventually, we were able to raise some money in the United States. And in August, five years ago, almost five years now, in the, this August, we went the first time and the last time um, to do the project. But this time, I decided to pick up the people I want to work with. And the second person I decided to work with that I brought in into the picture is Adam Ravitch, which is extraordinary filmmaker, is probably the one or the best filmmaker in the Arctic today. Uh, he won several Emmy Awards, he must, he's on programming. He's just outstanding friend of mine and we had a chance to do a few trips together. But not just that, Luckily enough, I was his mentor in his first few years in the 80s. And now become two people that I helped earlier in my life and to be known to me. And I'm sorry, I apologize, I did not do it to you the same. <laughs> but I did it for them or with them. And today, then they came back together, Adam and Yoni. And they were able to put all the logistics, the infrastructure, you know, to go out to do it again. And diving with Adam for me was like, like you mentioned at the beginning, to be with one of the people in this special unit in the military. Adam spent most of his life on the ice and filming, and he know the discipline that he takes to do it. He filmed I'm, uh, IMAX underwater with the polar bear. Actually, he did the movie, but together with me, because I was the first still photographer to be able to be with the polar bear. There are four other filmmakers that have been before Adam and I um, with the polar bear in the water. I was the fifth person. And to put it in perspective, there are over 4,000 people climbed the Everest. There were 12 people on the moon, but only five, maybe six people or seven now, together with um, uh, this lady, what her name, um, that she just did the story, uh, did together with, uh, um, and Mario, uh, the photographer from uh, Canada, and... Um, Christina Mittermeier, his wife? What? Christina Mittermeier. No, 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 Christina. Her name, her name, um, I forgot her name. Uh, Jill Reinhardt, Jill Reinhardt, yeah. Uh, she did it together with him, I think, last year or year before, 
and had a chance to see the video they've done. The only thing I can say that will be different, when we photographed the polar bear, I did not want to photograph only a bear in the water because for me, it is not boring. Indeed, it's very complicated task, logistic and everything else, but it is not the key issue. It's not the animal, the issue. Images that we do today, I believe, have to be with full of emotion, intimacy. What I wanted badly is to have an image that will be a polar bear with a cub. And Mother Nature gave me even better than this. Eventually, the last day, she gave us a mother with two cubs. And we, fo we photographed them, Adam filmed them, and I took the still of all these three together. It was just mind boggling. It's amazing when Mother Nature gives you, if you play with harmony mother, and let Mother Nature lead the situation and us just be part of it. And that's exactly what happened. It was just, for me, it was the biggest present till today. And actually that film really, really moved me because I felt identified on several aspects. Uh, it, it, it's funny because you started out in the diving business with the liverboards, but not because of the diving business. And my way to be able to make a living closer to the ocean and doing what I love was through a liverboard as well. And I ended up entangled in the business side of it, which I didn't like. And now I'm trying to correct that, which probably you find familiar. And also I come, I, I grew up in Mexico City, which is a city in the middle of the country surrounded by mountains, uh, 2,000 meters, which is the same as 6,000 feet above sea level. Uh, the closest ocean, it's probably a five, six hour drive, which can either be Acapulco or Veracruz. And my parents were very different from what I am today. They were very conventional. They tried to play it safe. They never tried new things. So, so, so I actually felt identified with you on several aspects. And another storyline that was highlighted on the film is your relationship with your father. <laughs> and I know that's very personal, but I really want to ask you because, uh, and I'm going to really open up right now because I, I never cry. I can be really... I know it's not healthy, but I, I, I'm more of a cold person. And the last time I cried, and probably the only time I've cried in the last, I don't know, probably five years or more, considering that I lost a, a lot of important people in my life, was when my father told me he was proud of me because I, I, I actually thought he wasn't and because we're so different and he's achieved so much and I've done all, I, I, I'm very impulsive and I want to do what I like and I never think about the consequences but I do things and when he told me he was proud and that he actually admired me that broke me and I wanted to ask you Amos is your father proud of you whatever he is I don't know if he's part of me because he's out there speaking different language now and dreaming differently and in another, another world. And he was not part of me when he left, unfortunately. And um, I knew that, and I knew it since I was relatively younger. Um, and I knew that I needed to take care of myself. And that was all right. And we are, we are tremendous soul, all of us, all the 7 billion live on the planet. Uh, we are tremendous soul. If we don't give in uh, to um, different layers and how other people think of us or tell us, but if we are honest with ourselves, deep, deep, deep inside. And I guess in my case, it happened that, of course, for, for reasons which are as a result for where my father came from North Africa into Israel with the independence, they were very poor, they had to work very hard for their life and all the history of the Israelites first, that they're creating the nation. So naturally, and the idea in Judaism, there is no divers, there's no photographer underwater. <laughs> so for, for him to hear that that's what I want to do, it was very strange, it was very unheard of. It was impossible, are you crazy? I was the, the older one, so he was looking up to me to be able to lead the family. 
bring him grandchildren. And that nothing of this was in my conscious, nothing this was in my direction. And for him, it was a great disappointment. Um, however, I knew that I need to live the life for myself. I don't, cannot live his life, and then I regret it. And so I lived my life, and that's why we left. Uh, it was sad, but I'm happy today because I'm living my life, and that is the key to share happiness now with you and to see how you grew up and the friendship that we created, either with Adam and Yoni, or either with um, all other people, that over 5,000 people that I've led around the world, and the, all of them back home telling the story about their joy to be in the wilderness. And for, for what it's worth, and, uh, uh, and for all the similarities I know, I, I, I can tell you that, that he is, and from what I saw in the film. And, well, anyway, so going back, actually, you, you were saying you're sorry because you didn't took me in. I, I think it was a good thing because I was a young kid that I, I was really, really young. And I, I wanted somebody to point the way or to take me in and, 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 and go straight in there. But actually to be able to realize that I can make my own way and to discover that, I think it was much better. And, and, and you get to appreciate things even more. And one thing that I get asked a lot, and I, I'm sure you still do, and that I always try to reply because I can really see myself in those shoes, is when young people ask me, where can I begin? What, how can I start to do what you do to, to, to become a wildlife photographer, to be, able to, to be in the ocean with these animals? Or what advice would you give to young people trying to follow on these footsteps, trying to make their dreams co come true. Because you're right, you have to make a lot of sacrifice, sacrifices and you have to be really stubborn. For me, that's a key, stubbornness. Uh, and, and then there, there are more things. You have to be resourceful uh, and talent helps. And, but what would you say to someone young that's really, really hungry and that really wants to do what you do and that someday wants to become someone like you, what would you say? I will start from the, from the other side. It is, um, it is a good, it looked like a conglomerate job. And many people want to do that because of the glorious that's supposed to be there. The glory is supposed to be there. And um, unfortunately it is not. So, that mean that whoever wants to become tomorrow also a wildlife photographer really need to ask himself if he's really, really, really willing to sacrifice. As I said before, I did not know the question come up. When I asked Yoni, are you willing to sacrifice? And when he asked me what, I said, everything you got, everything, friends, family, money, time, even comparing yourself to your friend that in five years from now, if he's married, and has a Lamborghini, or has a Porsche, or has a small plane, or a boat, or even a motorcycle and a house, and you don't have any. Are you willing to sacrifice all of that? And if you are, then you have a chance. And then because you are false, because you put yourself in such a tough bind, then you find the answer within yourself. There is no magic, there is no school that I know. You can go to school, you can go to school to learn photography, you can go to school, learn diving. You can go to school to do filmmaking. You can buy the best camera in the world. But like what you do now, putting, my, putting yourself learning how to edit, putting yourself to how to take pictures, you can start from home. There is a very young, relatively young photographer uh, that I met many years ago. Um, he lived in the Bahamas. Um, what is his name? Gross, uh, Shane Gross. I know, and, yeah. he, and he is... Um, bring the story that he bring with no much money. He worked with his father in the dive shop, but he's by the dive shop all the time. But he decided, they left Canada into the Bahama to do it. And, um, and Shane keep working only in the Caribbean, mostly in the Caribbean. And he provide, bring extraordinary work from a point of view of marine biology, of research, of following the shark. That you don't need to be what I do now and go all around the world, or you do and you did beginning with pelagic safaris and so on and so forth. 
It's not about that. It is about a style you develop within yourself. You believe in yourself and willing to put, and then eventually it show up. People come to recognize, like I today, say all the respect to Shed Gross. <laughs> and, and as a friend of yours, perhaps, and mine, and people see, but we're now speaking about him. He is an example of one, and you can be the same, but if you determine that you're willing to put everything behind you, not comparing to your friends, not comparing to anything else, not looking at the car that's passing by or the house that you see there, but focusing on what you need. There is a very interesting Chinese statement that said, obstacles are only those things that you see when you take your eyes off the target and you see they are on the side of the road. I, I can definitely relate to everything you said. And I think in this order, I would say passion, stubbornness, and sacrifice. And, and there's no formula, there's no way of getting there. You just have to get creative. A lot of people think that I am, that, that I make a living from being an underwater photographer. I don't. <laughs> I had to buy a big ass liveaboard <laughs> that was a good business to be closer to the ocean and make money so I could do what I actually loved, which was underwater photography and going out and exploring. And eventually, it, it, I ended up with no time to do what I love. And I had this fallout with uh, some business partners that we didn't share the same vision. And I, at, at first, I was super angry because that company was my vision and my baby and my project. And I left everything behind to do this. And it took less than three months to realize that it was, that to get rid of that rhythm of that being jumping for, from airplane to airplane, going to the office in San Diego to see the, the lawyers in Mexico City, to go to a trade show in Dusseldorf or to a trade show in Moscow or to Vegas or, and, it took me two months to realize that it was the best thing that could ever happen to me because I finally, I moved to, to Baja three, three years ago and it was only from this January that I was able to go out on my boat and enjoy, go out on my with motorcycle. Your dog, with your dog. With my dog who, <laughs> who was crazy about whales and dolphins and, it's a very interesting <laughs> story. Huh? But yeah, it was the best thing that could ever happen to me. And there is no formula. I just have to get creative and find a way to make it yeah. happen. Maybe it is driving a taxi cab at night in New York City. Maybe it is dealing with fucking lawyers or business partners or salespeople or government doing loving with government i'm really good at it but i hate it but there it's just again passion stubbornness being determined and willing to sacrifice a lot of I will, things i will change only the word stubbornness because stubbornness is not is not there are no flexibility to see when things changing around you and to be able to modify and give you put you back in the main road stubbornness i don't think it is a very good Determination, yes, okay. but and uh, determination to be into the direction you want, but and with the flexibility to see where things changing and moving, so you can plow forward. Yeah, because yeah, you will can knock you down. Yeah, definitely, you need to adapt. If you cannot exactly. adapt to the circumstances, then you're doomed. Exactly. But I would also say that if you're determined but you're not stubborn, you're probably gonna give up easier. But <laughs> Don't well, give up. no, never, never give up if there's something you like. And that's, I think that's when, when you really know that you're really passionate about something is when you, when everything is dark and when everything is murky and when the conditions are not right and you're not giving up, that's when you can know that you're actually passionate and, and, and that your motivation is not like you said, like fame or glory or or whatever, it's because you love what you're doing and that's when you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So if you're really passionate, 
everything else is just going to fall into place and get there. And uh, unless you have anything else to say, Amos, I think that's a very good note to end the conversation. Uh -huh. That's a very high note. And, uh, and I don't know, you, do you want to add anything? I, wa I want to only to add to, to see how proud I am of you and for people to see for, for where you come from, from the moment you sent me the email and I did not reply in kind. <laughs> I'm not sorry, not that I'm sorry about it, but it's good that you bring it up. This is pattern of life. You can take, you can receive many. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. you. You can receive a lot of negative, a lot of no answers, and then you prevail because the more no you get, the more put you back into the main road to where you want to go. Uh, and that is where you are now. So thank you for the opportunity to share uh, and with anybody else and to see you in your success. And uh, let me just add, Amos, for me, it's not negativity. And I'm going to add another uh, personal experience that also has to do with my dad. It's going to, uh, I don't have real, uh, daddy issues. I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I was 22, which was probably around the time that I emailed you, I had a very serious accident on a dirt bike. Mm -hmm. where I lost my big toe on my right foot. And it's funny because as I grew up, I always wanted to ride a motorcycle. And it's something that I do really well now and that I love. But when I was a kid, my parents never really allowed me to do that or they never bought me a motorcycle because they thought it was dangerous. Like I said, they were always on the safe side of things. So when I was 22, and I had a job and I could pay for my very first motorcycle. I did and I bought it. And less than a year in, I had this accident. That accident, I was almost a month in the hospital. Oh. I spent counting the month in the hospital, almost six months without being able to walk. And just before I was about to leave the hospital, my dad walks into the hospital room and he throws this envelope on top of me. I had, uh, I had a broken collarbone, my right foot. I lost a big toe. I had like three fractures, two luxations. I lost a lot of the skin on the sole of the foot and on the top. So I couldn't move. I was, I, I was like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he, he walks in and he throws an envelope on top of me. I'm like, What's this? He says, well, that's the insurance bill. And I'm like, well, I haven't even walked out of the hospital. Like, are, are you serious? And he's like, yeah, you wanted to ride a bike. You were like big enough to get your own bike. And it's not like you got appendicitis. He turns around and he walks out of the room. And I think that's the same as when I wrote you that email that was I, I was an arrogant kid back then and I wrote you an email that I want to learn I want to do what you do and actually your reply was like okay if you know like people with money in Mexico which is my target my kind of customers and you can hook them up you can get a, con a commission and you can probably come on an expedition and that's right mm -hmm. it's 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 working for dinner what you proposed <laughs> and I probably took it the wrong way and you could say it was negativity and, and, and the same with my dad, but I think not. I think those kind of things forge character and, and those things, and obviously the, the, the insurance bill was way more relevant in my growing up than your email. <laughs> but thanks to stuff like that, I, I became, for, for, for better or, or for worse, the, 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 the man I am today. And I've achieved whatever I've achieved today. So I think that's actually a good thing. And whenever these kind of things happen, and like the COVID thing right now, which to people like us that are in the tourism or expedition industry, we were hit first and we were hit the hardest, and we're, it's gonna take longer to recover for people in our industry. 
But I think this is what makes us people with passion and determination and stubbornness and willing to make sacrifices. It, it's what makes us survive and what makes us stronger and what makes us get to the places we want to get. Mm -hmm. So I, now on that note, <laughs> I want to say to the people listening, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. By, by the time you listen to this, it should be up on iTunes. It should be up on Spotify. We should have a YouTube channel with the, with the Zoom conferences uh, on them. Uh, you can find Amos on Instagram as Amos Nahum Photography. Uh, your company is BigAnimals.com, which was also a big inspiration for everything I did. You can find me on Instagram as uh, at JC Hauser. My company is called Baja My Love. And uh, for now, all I can say and all I can wish to everyone listening is to have fair seas, following winds, and see you or listen to you uh, next week. Amos, thank you so much for this. I, like I said on the beginning, I really wanted to have a, a first episode. I wanted to start this with a bang. And you're not only a friend, you're one of the people I admire the most. And, uh, and I'm really honored for you to be my first guest on the Hydrophone. So thank you so much, Amos. Thank you too, uh, Jorge. It is a pleasure to look at you and to see a young generation like yourself so devoted and so motivated and driven to what I started and what other people before me started and I follow them. So, so to know there are good people like you, like Yoni and Adam uh, coming as a younger generation and taking the lead in protecting, protecting the environment and showing to the world how beautiful is the ocean and especially in your case, Mexico. So thank you for the opportunity to reach through you or through your people or through the younger generation and the message that you learn from me and together we share with other. Okay, just as a postscript, I want to add that I really wanted to make these uh, conversations. One of my uh, rules, so to speak, was going to be for uh, my guest uh, to have a drink with me, just like as if uh, we just came back from, the, from a long day on the ocean and we're having a ceviche and a beer or we're having wine over dinner or enjoying a whiskey. And you, like myself, are a big fan of, of, of a good coffee, of a good espresso, and you just had one, so you didn't have a drink with me. What I did, uh, I had some uh, Japanese single malt, and this is my second one during this conversation. So I'm just gonna say cheers, even though I'm by myself. <laughs> thank you so much, Amos. And I'll be seeing you soon. And I hope as soon as this is over, I'll be over to the Bay Area. Or, you know, you're always welcome as a guest. And we have to get out on the ocean soon. But before we leave, who is your next guest? People need to know. They may be tuned in. Who is okay. the next guest? Okay, my next two guests are also good friends of mine and are also people that I admire. And uh, the next guest is Eli Martinez. Uh, which is someone that I, he, he's a very, very dear friend of mine and he was deeply involved in all of the Pelagic fleet efforts, the Pelagic Life and Mexico Pelagico projects early on. And then the next guest is gonna be uh, Andy Casagrande, which is also a very good friend, a very charismatic, a very successful uh, guy. So I made a huge list. <laughs> and uh, and I'm trying to get the people I like the most at the beginning. I hope the people that I invite next don't get offended by this. But I really wanted you to be the very first one. I'm really honored. I really admire you. I'm really happy and proud to, to be able to call you my friend. And again, cheers. Lahaim. <laughs> and I'm honored too for to be able to be called a friend of yours and to be able to relate to you and together with you to other people. So all due respect to what you achieved till now, 
what you went through, and I know some of it, not all of it. So all my respect, and I look forward to see your success and able to contribute whenever you need me. I'll be there with you and for you. I know, and you know I'll be there for you as well. Thank you so much, Amos. Thank you.